Hello, this is uh, Greg Anthony, and I wanted to make a special announcement before my show today. I was informed by the Alamo Ministry that Pastor Tony Alamo passed away to see the Lord yesterday. As you know, I've been covering this story for more than a decade, watching this travesty of justice and how this man was put in prison for crimes he never committed just because he wanted to spread the word of God and spread the word about the Vatican-led New World Order, which I cover on this show most every day. My condolences go out to everyone at the Alamo Ministry, the friends that I've met, and this is a loss that I'm not going to let people forget about. How this man was treated, how this ministry was treated, it is one of the greatest travesties of justice in our time. It shows there's no freedom of religion here, and we're all living a hypocritical life if we don't admit it. So in the days to come, I will do some shows, memorial shows, to remember Tony's name, and I always want to continue doing shows so these people aren't forgotten. And I know Tony, I've talked to him many, many hours, wouldn't want the ministry to be forgotten. He'd want it to grow and prosper. And I think that's what we'll do in the future is try to help these people grow and prosper so others see the true word of God. So again, my condolences for the ministry's loss. But I know Tony's happy now in heaven with the Lord. And uh, it's a great destination. So for you, Tony, thanks for everything you did. I know you suffered and unwarranted suffering for things that many of us here talk about, but you will not be forgotten. Now back to... Okay, Greg Anthony here, and glad you're back on the Investigative Journal on this May 3rd. Wow, how time goes by. This May 3rd, 2017 day on our calendar. The last few shows I've been talking about the Jesuits' War Manual, or Sun Tzu's Art of War, and I wanted to mention that... Uh, it's not only, uh, the art of war doesn't only take place on the battlefield. Really, it's the deception of most everything in life that takes place. Uh, I've always said the Jesuits and the Vatican want to control your mind, body, and soul in every possible way. And we left off with uh, Walter Weith talking about how they manipulate theatrical performances going back to the 1500s, controlling the theater, controlling music. They do it today in Hollywood. And Walter Weith was talking about the connection of Mozart to the Jesuits. I'm going to go one step farther and say that uh, there's what's called the manufacturing of Mozart. And I remember years ago I interviewed a gentleman, a British researcher, musicologist named Robert Newman. And he was showing how uh, this English author, and he wrote a book about it. I'm not sure if it ever got out. I'll have to check on that. But the English, this English author shows Jesuit control of the arts dating back to 400 years. And he not only says that Mozart was, uh, like Weith was saying, that Mozart's family was deeply involved with Jesuits. What he's saying is that Mozart never even was a child prodigy and never wrote all the things that they say he wrote, that the Jesuits, through a number of different musicians and writers, put together the fake Mozart. They, they do the deceiving uh, just like they do today. They create these images, uh, Madonna and all of these other singers and, and actors. They control Hollywood. They're, they've been doing it for years. Remember we did the story about Shakespeare and how Shakespeare most likely never wrote all those things? Look at his background. And it was also written by a number of Jesuits, all the plays, all the control. And let's go back a little bit and talk about that. And I've got some uh, words here by Robert Newman, what he says. But let me, let me say this first. One of the most extraordinary theatrical events ever put on by the papacy was when Gregory, Pope Gregory XV, the first Jesuit student to become pope, canonized Ignatius Loyola. And we're going to uh, talk about this for a second. Nowhere in the Bible is canonization condoned or authorized. It is simply a Vatican adaption of a pagan ritual wherein men are elevated to godlike status. Of course, the men elevated to sainthood are chosen by men who have elevated themselves to godlike status. 
without any particular biblical authority. And so the live theater of the Vatican continues all the way to today, ever since Gregory's brief pontificate of three years was marked by the blockbuster theatrical performance when Loyola, a bloodthirsty killer in the Pope's army, was elevated to a pagan god on March 12, 1622. Now, today, schools and colleges are named after him. The Jesuits call him their guiding light in a world of darkness. And presidents and popes sit under his portrait when they meet in the Vatican for a beer and a friendly chat on how to create new crusades and genocides. If you take the whole thing too seriously, it will drive you nuts. But if you look at it for what it is, good theater, without an ounce of truth, perhaps you can live through the next theatrical onslaught of the Vatican in Illuminati madness bound to kill millions. The star of their show here in America is none other than Donald Trump. And soon he will be paying a visit to the Jesuit Pope Francis, and they can sit under the picture of Ignatius Loyola, that bloodthirsty killer, and conjure up some more good theater for you. So what is this obsession with the Vatican and Jesuits creating this great theater in the real world and on the silver screen. Now listen to this. In 1957, Pope John XXIII, in his encyclical Miranda Process, told us about the lofty goals for Jesuit theater, announcing, quote, Men must be brought into closer communion with one another. They must become socially minded. These technical arts, cinema, sound, broadcasting, and television can achieve this aim. The Catholic Church is keenly desirous of these means be converted to the spreading and advancement of everything that can be truly called good, embracing as she does the whole human society within the orbit of her divinely appointed mission. She is directly concerned with fostering of civilization among all people. Remember what I said? The control of mind, body, and soul. And when we're talking about Sun Tzu's art of war, the Jesuits have understood deception is the key. And controlling the thought process, controlling the political landscape, controlling Hollywood, controlling theater is very important. They can get their message out. Thus, when they were trying to reconstruct their message during the 50s, guess what you saw? Because their reputation after World War II wasn't the greatest here. There were still people talking about the Pope and the Vatican being the Antichrist system. So what did they do? They put out a whole bunch of, remember Bing Crosby and all those movies about how, you know, uh, the bells of St. Mary, etc., etc. A changing of the image on the silver screen. Now, directly talking to producers and directors, your holiness, who I call hellishness, went on, quote, There must be a paternal injunction not to allow films to be made which are at variance with the faith and Christian moral standards. Now, here they go again. They're talking about, they're, they're intermingling Catholicism with Christianity, and that's not, shouldn't be done, because Catholicism is not Christianity. Uh... Should this happen, which God forbade, then it is the bishops to rebuke them, and if necessary, to impose upon them appropriate sanctions. So they want to control the silver screen. Then John the Twenty Third told Pius the uh, Eleventh's National Film Reviewing Offices to do the following: quote, "Be entrusted to men who are experiencing in the cinema, sound broadcasting, and television, television under the guidance of a priest." specially chosen by the bishops. At the same time, we urge that the faithful, and particularly those who are militant in the cause of the Catholic Action, a Jesuit organization, by the way, be suitable instructed so that they may appreciate the need for giving to these offices their willing, united, and effective support. Now, remember this. According to, and I'll get to the manufacturer of Mozart in a minute, according to researcher the late Tupper Saucy, Controlling the theater and cinema for the last four centuries, the aim is to mass-produce in America Jesuit graduates schooled in Jesuit ratio studiorum. He points out the aim of modern entertainment and public schooling in America, which is uh, what Martin Luther warned, and remember Columbine attests, is to ignore scripture and Bible teachings, turning our schools into a widening of the gates of hell. 
He adds that Jesuit universities are no longer chartered institutions. It has become our entire social environment. The movies, the mall, the school, the home, the mind. Most of the content of modern media, whether television, radio, print, film, stage, or web, is the state-of-the-art Jesuit ratio studiarum. And you know what, folks? It's hard, hard for Americans to believe that the Jesuits and the Vatican have had their control fingers on entertainment and education for at least four centuries, perhaps more. You know something? Remember what I said. This is a, They have controlled this for a long time. But if you are doubtful, take the time to look at how they even controlled and manufactured the most famous composer of all time. According to Robert Newman, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. Be assured, if they could control the manufacturing of Mozart, they can do the same to the likes of Bono, Madonna, Tom Hanks, Ron Howard. Remember all those movies they made, the Angels and Demons, depicting the Vatican fighting the evil Illuminati? Well, you know, my inside sources were watching Ron Howard and Tom Hanks fly over to the Vatican, walk in the Vatican, and congregate with the Pope, and everyone to get this movie made. And they made a couple more. And they're working together with Jesuit Ratio Studiarum. And to prove this point, back to English author Robert Newman, and let's make sure I don't run out of time here. Oh, we got plenty of time. Uh, uh, But if doubtful, take the time to look at how they control this. And to prove the point, I want to talk about Robert Newman. And I interviewed him years ago. Go back to some of my old show. He's dedicated, at that point, back in 2008 or nine when I interviewed him, over 15 years of his life, uncovering how the Vatican and Jesuit, Jesuits perpetrated the Mozart fraud. Newman recently appeared, and this was years ago on my show, the investigative journal, and provided the following preview of his book, entitled The Manufacture of Mozart. Okay, he says this, and I'm going to read some of his quotes, and I got an article he wrote then and things that I talked to him about that I'll continue with because it's really a good subject because if they can do this, look how deceiving they are. Don't you think they can manufacture presidents, rulers of all you know other countries to work together for their goal of one world order, one world government, one world mindset? And Newman said this, The name of Mozart has long been synonymous with the term musical genius. Mozart is the uh, the archetypical composer of the well-known film Amadeus. We all remember Amadeus, whose trailer leads with the statement that, quote, everything you heard is true. And yet, there is growing but little known evidence from detailed study of manuscripts and other lines of evidence that Mozart's entire career was almost entirely manufactured with the full assistance of the Jesuit order and later from members of fraternities after the Jesuit ban in 1773, including individuals associated with the Freemasons and still later the Illuminati. This manufacture of Mozart, says Newman's status, during his short lifetime and later within Western civilizations, generally by the way of sympathetic biographies and music publishing, is a classic case of systematic and deliberate misinformation deception in the area of culture, which involved and still involves suppression of historical musical fact. To create Mozart's huge and dominating status in Western culture required steady supply to him throughout virtually all his life of works he never wrote. This is an extraordinary, even wholesale scale, a process still continuing even after his untimely death in December 1791. A music composed by men whose names are today little known, members of a fraternity, most of which were Jesuit educated or closely allied with them. Now, I'm going to break in for a second. Remember their goal. They want to be in the background. They want to control countries. They want to control leaders without anybody knowing they do it. Remember the Jesuit general years ago who said that? We control the entire world. We control China, everywhere else from this little office in uh, Rome at Santo Spirito Cinque Five, and nobody knows it. 
Nobody knows we're doing it. They're doing the same thing here, perhaps, according to Newman. Now, so he's talking about all these names that we don't know who are, and they don't care. With the ultimate objective of such a project to create in the name of a man a musical superman, so that music as an industry could be more easily controlled internationally, and also money, 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 through an approved person by creation of this myth. This, at the price, of course, of virtually suppressing works by many, many composers, ever since Mozart's image has been spoken of by other composers in such revered terms, revered terms, that it is almost seems impossible to think of him in any other way. To the late 19th century composer Peter Tchaikovsky, Mozart is the musical Christ. To philosopher Soren Kierkegaard, the music of Mozart was reason to consider establishing a new religion. And to theologian Karl Barth, Karl Barth, Mozart was an angel. Hardly surprising, says Newman, he was soon described as belonging to an elite pantheon of Vienna composers, such as Joseph Haydn, Ludwig van Beethoven, <clears throat> whose own stories have hardly ever been told. These iconic, this iconic view of music history seems to be inevitable, but it had the effect of slowly reducing the subject, almost without realizing it, to virtual, virtual idolatry. Isn't that what we do today? We idolize these musical singers, these actors. They've put on a pedestal, like Tom Hanks, Ron Howard, he's at it ever since he was Opie on um, the Andy Griffith Show, remember? To, and then we idolize these people like they're gods, Steven Spielberg, etc., etc. A pantheon of accepted demigods of music who seem unchallengeable because of their unique works, not unlike those statues which stand on Easter Island off the coast of South America. We live in a world where cultural icons of this kind dominate our own landscape, but where in the case of music, the input of other talented musicians of Mozart's times are simply unknown, or have been hugely and deliberately suppressed. The genius of Mozart, carefully controlled by either biographers and later sympathizers, was further exaggerated and transformed into the huge industry we know today, so that the bubble once created, expanded, and expanded to huge dimensions, even were even greater color and fascination, to the point where music study seems impossible without acknowledging Mozart's musical genius. That much of his music attributed to Mozart, through by no means all, is of great and lasting quality is undeniable. But that he, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, was its true composer is a very different issue. What we find, in fact, is that the music history we find in books and reference sources in which is widely taught has been as corrupted and twisted as that of any other field of human activity. Even worse, for in the case of Mozart in particular, there is little, if any, cross-examination of what we are told. The Jesuit control of Mozart began even before he was born with the education of his father, Leopold in his native Aug Augsburg, Germany. Leopold was educated by, Jesuit, by the Jesuit order there. It was a Jesuit college which staged one of his son's earliest works in Salzburg, and it was a Jesuit priest, Abi Bullinger, who remained in the closest contact with Mozart even at the age of 22, when during a visit he made to Paris with his mother in 1778, she died in the French capital after a period of illness. It was to the same Abbey Bullinger that Mozart announced her death by letter. This days before he broke the news in another, in, in another to his father. And the list of Jesuits and occultists involved in the manufacturing of his career is very long. Amongst those involved were Jesuit educated men such as composer Giovanni Passello, Antonio Salieri, Andrea Lucchesi, Paul Ranitsky, Anton Ranitsky, Joseph Martin Krauss, Vincenzo Reggini, J.B. Van Hal, Joseph Fiala, Joseph Cantillieri, Joseph Maesevovic, Abi Maximilian Statler, Abi George Vogler, J.C. Bach, H.A. Gelinek, and Teresa von Paradis, and many, many others, says Newman. And I'm not talking about the Newman on the Seinfeld show. 
and after 1773 came the Illuminati, with members of which Mozart had many, many associations, these including mu music publishers such as Hofmeister in Vienna, Simrock in Bonn, in Antari in Breitkopf, and Hartel. Together with a string of patrons such as Baron van Swieten, Prince Lukowski, Prince Fustenberg of Deutschenberg, Prince Lobowitz of Bohemia, and many, many others, including various members of the Rosicrucian Order, the Freemasons, and a string of others belonging to various orders of the Holy Roman Empire. The post-humanist post creation of Mozart, gigantic reputation, took decades, and that story has hardly been told. But his refutation remains to this day the product of a fusion of the occult with that of extreme conservatism of the Holy Roman Empire during the late 18th century, the chief product of which is the corporate domination of musical and cultural history and little appreciation of the lives and talents of these other real composers. J.S. Bach, of course, did not officially exist to that empire. He was to be rediscovered only decades later. So that's a little bit of a background of Mozart, you know, how that did this possibly happen. But, you know, I want to go a little bit deeper because here's exactly what Newman said. And I'm going to read it to you. And I got four minutes on this side and we'll finish it. I'm a British writer, researcher on the life, career, and reputation of Mozart, 1756-1791. And as of two, he's into it over 20 years, and so too in writing a highly controversial book on this subject. He is based in London. I'm specifically interested in the relationship between writers of Mozart's time with the Jesuit order. Seems to me, Enlightenment philosophers such as Voltaire and Rousseau, both hugely important to Mozart's story, were themselves strangely allied during their lifetimes with the controlling aims of the Jesuit order, even beyond 1773. Indeed, the Enlightenment as a movement seems to have been a Jesuit-led strategy which flourished after the same Jesuit order was officially annulled in 1773, although, like we've talked about, folks, they were still around. They were just, um, you know, working undercover. So that the rise of what is generally called secularism in the name of the Enlightenment was very much controlled, orchestrated, and even defined by the deliberate rise of the adoration of Rousseau and Voltaire, both of whom had close relationships to the Jesuits and to the fraternities which emerged after 1773. Mozart's relationship with the encyclopedists, Diderot, Grimm and others, De Pitney and others, are clear evidence of such a relationship. 1778, Mozart's Paris patron during his stay there was the same Baron Grimm. I am sure, and uh, let's check the time here. I don't want to run over. Okay, I got three minutes, so don't run over, Greg. I am sure and have much supporting evidence that the musical career of Mozart was almost entirely manufactured, falsified even from the time of his childhood onward by the fraternities of the Holy Roman Empire, this involving the supply of Mozart even after his death in 1791, a music he never composed, but which, being published and performed in his name as evidence of his genius, eventually led to a Mozart-dominated musicology, a hijacking of historical reality, the destruction of musicology itself, and the control of what is taught and believed on music in this important period of musical history. The musical evidence from manuscript, etc., is now very clear, and other researchers are increasingly agreeing with my view. In my research over the last 20 years or so, I've become more and more certain of the above. Certain, too, that the most fratern the secret fraternities of Western Europe, such as the Rosicrucians, Freemason, and the Luminists, have invented idols of their own, of which Mozart was one, so that they could, by controlling their mythical standards in the academic world, shape and even define our education far more than is generally realized. Interesting. Okay, now, I remember over the years, and I'm going to read, uh, Robert's written some more here that I want to read, uh, but I remember I did many hours of interviews with him, and he was very methodic, methodical about how they did this, how Mozart very rarely, he didn't perform in public, and it's incredible that most of his works, 
had been performed by other people. And the fact that he was a musical genius is well hidden, and only a few ever knew about it, and it was controlled by the Jesuits. And if you go back to some of my old shows, you'll see how he has uh, put together the story that lays solid evidence that we have to look at this. But he also talked to me about how he's been how he's been ha harassed, how it's difficult to get a book like this published, how that everyone from you know where came down on him. So this is not other evidence that the man you know he could not get any of the so-called musicologists to even debate with him. The control of the Jesuits is enormous. Their deception is widespread. Why wouldn't they do it? Remember all the shows they did on Shakespeare and how they manufactured him as well? And how the same situation occurs of suppression, of harassment by the people who want to get this out? All to keep the cover over the truth. And uh, we'll get back with more of this, the uh, Art of War, the Manual of War by the Jesuits. I'm going to play a little bit in the second half hour, but I want to finish this with Robert Newman, back in three minutes on the Investigative Journal, my show. <clears throat> The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment rights media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for missionary radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Okay, we're back for the second half hour of the Investigative Journal. I want to continue with the manufacturing of Mozart. And I remember when I was doing these stories, I got a lot of... Uh, People calling, you know, emailing me, you have too much time on your hands, Greg, and so does Robert Newman. Who cares? Well, it's important, very important. Now, let me tell you why. Just recently, the movie Angels and Demons was made. Now, that came out, it's a huge Vatican propaganda movie, funded to millions and millions of dollars. It still plays. Uh, you can watch it on TV all the time. That's just one of their movies. Uh, but, you know, Ron Howard and Tom Hanks were seen in the Vatican. They worked together. Now, when we pointed this out, I received the same kind of criticism. Oh, come on, Greg, you're going way too far. But this art of war, the Jesuits' uh, manual of war, includes this. You know, what, what do we talk about how they deceived us during the Revolutionary War, how they were pulling the strings behind the scenes? How they do this, and to show that they do it in all areas, is a way to control your mind, your body, and your soul. Now, Newman said this to me, and he said it to many others. He received so much criticism. He had a hard time getting this book published. And, you know, to be honest with you, I've, there's so many things going on that I've kind of left this story aside. But I'm going to check... Let's look to see if the manufacturer of Mozart, the book, ever made it. 
I'm going to do that this week. Okay, now Newman said this, it's not an easy thing to accept that our cultural education is largely nonsense. But this is truly the case with the history of music, as far as Mozart is concerned. Now, I'm going to add something. Remember I told you I want all my money back from my history classes that I took in university? How they didn't give me the full story? The same thing. Our cultural education is largely deceptive and it's hidden. The truth is hidden. But this is truly the case, says Newman, also with Mozart. The sheer volume of evidence is now overwhelming. Mozart, the genius of Salzburg, was really a musician of no great talent. His story begins long before his birth, and his myth was being manufactured, like he said, even decades after his death, by the elites who controlled culture during his own time and beyond it. The scale of corruption, the exaggerations and falsehoods that form part of Mozart's studies are so many that it took years to appreciate they were part of a cultural counter-reformation that was begun long, long before Mozart's time. In fact, the Jesuit order, created a few years before the Council of Trent in the 16th century, rose to become the schoolmasters of the Catholic Europe, utterly dominating education, censorship, etc., and I may add, just like they are today in America. It was within this context that the Counter-Reformation began, a Counter-Reformation which included control of publishing, even of art and culture itself. With growing protests against Jesuit domination coming from within the Catholic Church itself at times, it was clear by the early 18th century that these days of their control were numbered, so he says, but I say it was going just underground, and the corruption has even gotten bigger today. The massive complaints against this quality of the education, their corruption in politics and in other areas were so many in Portugal, France, Germany, and elsewhere that their expulsion from those countries was certain. Now, I maybe disagree, you know, I didn't get into this with Robert at the time, but the point is I believe they orchestrated this. Their way of, uh, gain, you know, they were they, they were getting some feedback, you know, feedback, back slashing. You know, they were getting criticism, so they basically orchestrated their own demise. And I remember bringing that out in a court trial that took place where Lorenzo Ricci purposely showed the uh, writings of the Jesuits to enrage the court so they would get thrown out. There's no reason he had to do that. He wanted the demise of his own uh, Jesuit order during this period of time, which included revolutions in America, French Revolution, etc., the revol so they could get their dirty work done. Because, remember in Sun Tzu's Art of War, it states this, make your enemy think you're weak and you can get more accomplished. Starting with, okay, so they're getting kicked out of Portugal and France and everywhere. But Newman goes on to say, but not before they had set in motion a new strategy of educational control. The Enlightenment, of which their employees, Voltaire and Rousseau, were two found, of two foundations. So they had now others doing their dirty work, right? Just like they had the Founding Fathers doing it here while they were in the background. And while the people said, well, they're no longer around, so they can't be our enemy. This entire shifting, says Newman, the emphasis of learning and literature across most of Europe, the life and career of Mozart are to be understood in this context. Mozart's father, himself a Jesuit educated, is only one of the dozens of links which led to the inescapable conclusion that Mozart's career was almost entirely manufactured. He was no musical genius and wrote, at most, half a dozen works of his own. There, there These are no great musical value, the truth hidden buried under the propaganda. The truth is, dozens of early Mozart works are not his. That's a plain fact, a fact recognized grudgingly in textbook after textbook. But the lies and exaggerations continued. Even the operas La Nozze di Figaro in 1786, Don Giovanni, and The Magic Flute are not by Mozart. In fact, Figaro is a hastily made arrangement of a work first written to a German text by others the year before, as we can see, if we actually examine the manuscript today, held at the National Library in Vienna. 
a work arranged by Mozart's colleague Lorenzo da Ponte and staged in Mozart's name in Vienna that year, but not a work of Mozart. Mozart was a musical fantasy created by those who, in the name of Vienna, city of music, sought to control musicology, and they did so, using the talents of composers whose names are today hardly known. Vienna hardly knew this man. It was all invented. He was the creation of fraternities of the late Holy Roman Empire, the Requiem, the Clarinet Concerto, the Piano Concertos, hundreds of symphonies, sonatas, and even operas that are not written by Mozart. And the lies continued to be told by publishers and propagandists, even to the earliest biographies. For almost 200 years, says Newman, the science of musicology has been hijacked by those who now control the music industry. An industry which never questions the assumptions on which Mozart, the Mozart myth is based. The result has been the destruction of the science of musicology itself, a science that first founded by the German J.N. Folk, uh, F-O-R-K-E-L, a science which warned against commerce taking over from art by its ruthless appeal to mass culture. It was Forkel who first brought the attention of the musical world to the ignored works of J.S. Bach, in which the Viennese were ignorant, even in the late 18th century. Musicology, the study of music of high quality, that is, of value for musical students, was overwhelmed by the rise of the Mozart cult. And today, despite his giant reputation of Mozart, together with that of Haydn and Beethoven, whose stories are really little known, the result is a generation of students who know virtually nothing of music by Mozart's own contemporaries, dumbed down by the dominant myth of Amadeus, a pack of lies foisted on innocent students of musical history. We do not know if historical fact and we, we do not know if historical fact and a total revision of music musical history by those presiding over this, one of the great myths of Western civilization. But one thing is for sure. From a documentary point of view, one, a detailed study of the musical manuscripts themselves and many other areas of research, the Mozart domination of music is a grotesque distortion of reality which deserves to be exposed. Have you heard of Van Hal, uh, Myselovic, I can't pronounce it, Ronitsky? These are only three of about 40 unknown composers who wrote the music today attributed to Mozart, the truth of which has been hidden buried under mountains of half-truths, and foisted on students who know no better. The rest, as they say, is the mass media, the corporate fraud that is Mozart. And, you know, when I was doing all these stories, I started to think, wow, what else have they done? How many other people have been manufactured by them? And if we look today, they're doing a heck of a lot behind the scenes we don't know about manufacturing politicians, manufacturing music idols. It's a it's an idol worship controlled, and guess who's making all the money? I think you know. Okay, we're going to get back to the Art of War and the Jesuit uh, War Manual and get back to a little bit of Walter Weith. Okay, we left off uh, the other day, yesterday, uh, where Walter was talking about how they controlled theater how they work in the entertainment field. And uh, this is part of their strategy. Here we go. ...instrument which was called Lanterna Magica, magic lantern. And with a powerful light, they could project images. Today... Oh, here we go. We've got to uh, take a break. We're back. ...of this Jesuit's great invention. The American cinema's early subject matter to capture the popular imagination was the cowboy. Now, cowboy movies were some of the first movies that were actually created in the United States of America. But uh, who had introduced cattle ranching to the United States in the first place? Did you know that the entire cattle industry in the United States was started by a Jesuit by the name of Kino? Very interesting. Eusebio Kino, whose statue is one of two representing Arizona in the U.S. Capitol building, was a Jesuit professor from Ingolstadt College in Bavaria, which is the same college where Adam Weishaupt, who founded 
of the Illuminati was Jesuit professor. So the Jesuits started the cattle industry, and then they came up with a great idea of making movies from the cattle industry, and all the great actors involved were, of course, all high Freemasons. Whether their name eventually was John Wayne, or whether their name was Frank Sinatra, or whether their name was whatever, they were all high Freemasons, used by Jesuit theatre. Okay. And in these movies, they brought in a morality based on good and evil, because the bad guys always lost against the good guys. And this is what people came to see. But the question is, was the morality ever based on the Bible, or was it a reality and a morality based on human perception of what is good and evil? You see, the second one is the case. After World War II, during September 1957, Pope John XXIII gave Jesuit theatre even broader horizons with his encyclical Miranda Prosus, looking ahead. And the Pope wrote, Many must be brought into closer communion with one another. They must become socially minded. These technical arts, cinema, sound, broadcasting, television, can achieve this aim far more easily than the printed word. The Catholic Church is keenly desirous that these means be converted to the spreading and advancement of everything that can be truly called good, embracing as she does the whole of human society within the orbit of a divinely appointed mission. How sweet of it. She is directly concerned with fostering of civilization amongst all people. John the 23rd wrote this, urged pious national film reviewing officers to be entrusted to men that are experienced in cinema, sound broadcasting, and television. And at the same time, he says, we urge the faithful and particularly those who are militant in the cause of Catholic action, that would be the Jesuits, to be suitably instructed. All right, this comes straight out of the pen of the popes. Well, this encyclical was amplified with a decree that was called Intermarifica, amongst the wonders. Now I want you to listen carefully to this quote from the Roman Catholic papacy directly. Okay, this is really good. It is the church's birthright, it is the church's birthright to use and own the press, the cinema, the radio, television, and others of like nature. Okay, now for those critics who uh, criticized me over the years for saying the Jesuits control the media, entertainment, they're telling you right here in their own words. Okay, back to uh, Walter Weith. Paul the Sixth. Now, excuse me, if you're going to own the press, the cinema, the radio, the television, and make provision for the future internet, others of like nature, then if it is her birthright, then how much of the press and the media does she want to control? All of it. Have you ever noticed that if you switch on your television and you want to see the news and you turn to CNN, and you're a little bit bored because you want to see something else that you've just heard about, so you switch to BBC. And they're talking exactly the same thing as CNN. Exactly the same news at exactly the same time. Then you get a little bit bored and you switch to Al Jazeera, and they're saying exactly the same thing. Exactly the same thing. And you switch to your local one and it says exactly the same thing. Uh, it's pure coincidence, of course, right? All right. So, these means must be used for social communication. The quality of entertainment content was decreed in a section of Intermarifica, and they tell you how it must be done, etc. All right, it is the church's birthright, not only to control it, but 
to own it. But who owns it today? Isn't that all the rich Jewish cultures that own all of these cinema houses? Uh, who actually owns them? Who actually controls them? And who writes what they write? And what is it that the mind must be prepared for? Because this is a battle for the mind. So we have to look into that before we can fully understand where the media is taking us. Because no matter which aspect you look at, even if they come from totally opposite aspects, it doesn't matter to them. CNN will be reporting it in one way. Russian television will be reporting the same thing in another way. Doesn't matter. Press TV, which is Iranian, will give you another viewpoint, but the issues are all exactly the same. And by these various mindsets, people are being channeled into thinking in one particular way. And if you don't understand the methodology, you won't understand the strategy. Now, this is just the Wikipedia piece on the Simpsons and philosophy. The Bull of Homer. The Simpsons and philosophy, the Bull of Homer, this is a book that has been published on the philosophy of the Simpsons. Now you might think, you know, the Simpsons. That's pathetic. Is it? How many millions of viewers do they have? Millions. Millions. Do you know that the, the writers of each episode get paid astronomical amounts of money? And did you know that the writers virtually all have either PhDs in philosophy, history, or mathematics. All of them. So what is behind the scene? For example, Simpson. If you add up numerically the value, it gets to 33. Now you'll say to me, excuse me, I think you're missing the boat somewhere because in numerology, you take the letter where it stands, Let's say you use A, then the value would be 1. B would be 2. C would be 3, etc. Then how come S works out to 1? Yeah. Some of them work out this way, some of them work out that way. So if you look at some of these characters, here you have a 33 cent store. The 33rd episode of the show aired in season 2 was titled The War of the Simpsons. The episode features a plot that gives tribute to Ernest Hemingway's Old Man on the Sea and features a battle for the ages between Homer Simpson and General Sherman. Let us quickly examine the numerology of Sherman. Sherman works out to 33. Simpson works out to 33. But what numerical uh, system are they using? Because they're not using the normal alphabet numerical system. And if you do a little research, then you'll find out that they're using Pythagorean numerology. Now, Pythagoras was a Greek occultist who forms part of the Gnostic Medici learning today. And he was a Greek philosopher that eventually was deified, because man becomes deified, and all disciples who follow him were worshippers of the man. Now, the Jesuits have a very similar philosophy. You all have to worship a certain man by being obey, obedient to one certain man. And the numerology of these names is incredible because Sherman works out at 33, Simpson works out at 33, they have a 33 store here, and it was the 33rd episode, etc., etc. And we know that the number 33 is very important in uh, numerology and in masonry and all of these things. Now, I'm not going to show you all because some people get upset when I show everything. But I'll show you a few. Now, one of the characters is always naughty and he always has to do lines on the blackboard. And they always have either a highly mathematical background or they have a play upon words. And here's one case. I will not plant subliminal messages. But look how it's spelled. I will not plant subliminal messages. El Go, Mesa Gore. All right, I will not plant subliminal messages, which means it's going.
like to plant subliminal messages. Now the Pope has just written an encyclical in which he asks for a total change in our <coughs> in our attitude towards the environment. Is that correct? Who's the great champion of the environment? Al Gore. So these are going to be issues. By the way, there are many, many things which we don't won't discuss here, which are there subliminally. And then HDTV is worth every cent. HDTV is worth every cent. Now, obviously, if that's what he says in his rebellious little mind, that implants an idea in every little child that's watching it, and he wants the latest technology so that it can be blasted away by Jesuit theatre. For example, this episode was aired in 1997, and it shows 9-11. And there are all the Masonic symbols, such as these over here, and this is just interesting to watch. The Pledge of Allegiance does not end with Hail Satan. What does this plant into minds? This is actual adult sitcom. So let's do a little bit of snooping and ask ourselves who controls what the world sees today. Well, if you go back to some of those earlier actors, here was Sammy Davis Jr. He claimed to be from the Church of Satan. But later he claimed to no longer be part of the Church of Satan. But he does have a certain Batman suit on here, which happens to be from the Order of Malta. So okay, I'm going to have to break off there. We're all out of time. But I think uh, the point is being made. We're going to continue this tomorrow and look at, really, all these, uh, the Simpsons are quite interesting. They also predicted... Uh, uh, that Trump would win, be the president. They uh, showed him walking down that famous uh, staircase, or the uh, in his in the Trump Towers. Remember, coming down the escalator. Go to that. That was ten years before. Was it two thousand one or so? Two thousand. Interesting. And he. That's exactly how he came down to the T. Back tomorrow on the Investigative Journal. The Book of Revelation says. The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today. So you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The prophecy. Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it. It has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen. There's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity. Invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188.